I'm Lily with ECTV, and on today's show, Juliana will be interviewing Sean Carswell about his punk rock magazine, Razor Cake. Hi, I'm Juliana Gutierrez with ECTV. Today I will be talking with Sean Carswell, founder of the punk zine, Razor Cake, and English professor at Cal State Channel Islands. So, how are you doing today? I'm doing good. How are you, Juliana? That's good. Well, I'm all right. Uh... Can you tell me a little bit about yourself and what you do? Yeah, I'm a English professor at Cal State Channel Islands and um, also, I guess, an old punk rocker. So where did you first learn about the independent punk scene? I, f- I first learned about it in, in the 1980s when I was growing up. And um, it, w- it was, I mean, obviously different then because there wasn't an internet or, I mean, there was an internet, but there wasn't a searchable browser and you couldn't just go on YouTube and look up any band. So, um, so because I grew up in kind of a small town in Florida, it took a while for punk rock to find me. And, and then when it did, it was bands like the Dead Kennedys or the Misfits or um, bands that were, bands that were just bigger and, and, um, and so then, like my friends and 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 I would just do everything we could to keep finding this music. You know, it, it really spoke to us. So um, you'd have to do like detective work. You know, you get a cassette and you open it up and you see who people are thanking, and then you you find those bands. Or there were a lot of independent record labels at the time, and you um, you write away for their catalogs. Like you even used to do this thing where you would write to someone and then you would send them a stamp so that they could send you a catalog. So, um, so we, we would do stuff like that. And then gradually more and more, you, you know, get to know more bands, more labels. And, and that's how I heard about it. How exactly did you start Razor Cake? And like, who did you do it with? Okay. Um, in 2001, I, I moved out to Los Angeles to start the print version of Razor Cake with a guy named Todd Taylor, who was a friend of mine. Um, and, uh, and I mean, like in, in, in the first issue, um, we had a bunch of contributors, maybe 30 contributors, but, um, Todd and I had to do a lot, you know, like we, we, we started it up as a, first as a business and we, then we made it a, a nonprofit. Um, but we had to do like all the all the business paperwork, the bank accounts. We had to do all the graphic design on the zine. We we had to do like all the distribution, and um, so for I moved out to L.A. in January of 2001 to start the zine, and the first issue came out in March of 2001. So it was it was pretty crazy. That is like really quick. Yeah. 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 It was. So where did the name Razor Cake stem from? So before Todd and I started the print scene, Todd had this idea that he wanted to do it as an internet magazine. And at the time, domain names were really important because you didn't just Google stuff because Google was kind of new then. Um, and so people would find things from their from your actual web address. And so we were looking, f- well, Todd was looking for something that uh, would be easy to search and something that he could buy the domain. And so Todd and, and the guy who built the, our first website is a guy named Danny Clark. So Todd and Danny and Danny's wife Katie were um, sitting around trying to figure out a name for the, uh, for the zine. Todd originally, I think, wanted to call it Born to Rock because he has Born to Rock tattooed on his belly. Um, but uh, but borntorock.com was maybe taken. Um, there were a few others. There were a few, like, very reasonable titles that were taken and so they just kept trying and trying and katie came up with this kind of nonsense word razor cake and obviously no one had taken it um and they just thought it sounded cool and uh i think it sounds cool i think it does it's like like a badass name that you would never expect like razors and cake you know what i'm saying yeah (laughs) yeah so what was the goal of razor cake when you first started like well (laughs) <laughs> well, there, there was like this sense of um, if you don't like the media, become the media, you know, and this is before social media. Um, so our idea was we didn't like the way music was being covered. We didn't like the bands that were being covered. Um, even though Todd and I are, are both white men, we kind of felt like the coverage of music was too white and too men. Um, and uh, what we really wanted were the 
bands that we were listening to, to get get listening to to get some press. We wanted we wanted to put out a zine where people could just find good music. Um, and so we we that that was our initial goal. But we also kind of we'd we'd both been um, at a different zine beforehand called Flipside, and um, and Flipside was a a really sexist zine. Um, there were a lot of photos of naked women in it. There was a lot of kind of um, misogynistic text. And um, I mean, I'd like to say I didn't, I wasn't part of that. I was, you know, um, no, but I, was, extent, yeah. I wasn't proud of being part of that. And, uh, and so part of us was, part of what we wanted to do was try to make it less white, less men, you know, even though, of course, <laughs> we are who we are, you know. Your website includes many forms of media, mm-hmm. like punk music, articles, and even a podcast. Mm-hmm. Who was your favorite interview? Like, who was your favorite band to talk to? Okay. So, uh, right right before I started Razor Cake, I was living in this town in Florida called Cocoa Beach. And I was writing for a free weekly called Inc. 19. And um, I was scheduled to interview a band called the Selby Tigers, and they were out of Minneapolis and they were playing in Orlando and um, I, their show that the show that I was supposed to go to and take pictures of them and and do the interview uh, was canceled and one of the, the guitarists uh, a woman named Arzu emailed me and she said hey I don't know if you still want to do the interview we're in this little town called Cocoa Beach have you ever heard of it and I was like yeah um, and they turned out to be just staying just a couple blocks away from um, a couple blocks away from where I live. So we spent the weekend. That w- what they were doing is they were waiting. Their bass player's grandmother died, and they were waiting for him to go to the funeral and then come back so they could continue the tour. So dur- during the time that they were kind of l- laid low, it was, I didn't have to work right then, so hung out with them. Um, we did a bunch of stuff. I showed them the area. And then at the end of it, we did the interview. Um, And it was kind of great, too, because my wife, well, she's my wife now. She was my girlfriend then, came and sat in and and did the interview with me. And she she asked way better questions than I did. So just like the whole the whole uh, atmosphere of it, like interviewing people after you've hung out with them for that long and and you really know what to ask. And and then, yeah, um, it's it's always it was always best when I could get my my wife involved, too. That's really cool. Yeah. Do you think that indie indie punk rock is different now than it was in the late 90s and early 2000s yeah yeah um you know like i mean i'm hesitant to say two white men wanted to start a a zine for to to provide more access um because i don't i mean i'm not trying to act like i'm a white savior i mean it was just i was just in a scene where uh i just didn't like the way it was going so i have this friend i'm still friends with her but she was in a band that that got pretty big for a while. It was called Less Than Jake. She played saxophone for it. And so she was on the on the Warp Tour. Her name's Jessica Mills. Um, so Jessica was on the Warp Tour. She was the only woman on the tour. Um, and that's kind of the way it was in late nineties. It was a real it was a real dude fest. Um, and it was it was I mean, there were a lot of Latinos, but it was all mostly white guys and Latinos. Um, and uh, it had kind of a bro element to it. And um, that wasn't my favorite time or, or approach to punk rock. I mean, I liked, I came up when I, when I, my favorite bands when I was coming up were bands like The Bags that Alec, Alice Bag was the, you know, and, and she's a radical Chicana and, and like in the 80, 81 when The Bags were coming out with their, with their crazy music. I mean, I like, I like that. Um, and so I wanted, I wanted that punk. Um, and uh, and so I think that punk is now more the punk that's coming out. You know, um, there's a lot more space for queer punks or the LGBT, LGBTQ community in general. Um, there's a lot more space for uh, the Chicanx punks. There's a lot more space for black punks. Um, in fact, yeah, I mean, two, two of my friends, two Razor Cake contributors, um, just had a book release on a on a book about black about black punks last night in LA um Chris Terry and James Spooner um so there's just I mean it's so so it's it's so much richer now you know there's so many more voices and that was always kind of the idea let's get as many voices as we can um and so 
yeah, it's, I think punk has changed, but it's gotten better. I agree with the misogyny in punk, like, um... Oh, it's still there. I yeah, mean, like, it, it I, didn't go away I still, the, the I still see it pretty often, like, if girls go into the mosh, like, mm -hmm. they'll get made fun of, or they'll, like, guys will, like, make fun of them because they're not doing it good enough. Mm -hmm. I just think it's messed up, like, isn't it, like, the whole point, like, inclusivity, because you're different? I mean, to me, that is the whole point. And I, I remember uh, in the 90s, there, there was kind of a, a movement in punk called the Ride Girl Movement. And um, when I'd go see those bands, what they were really insistent on was guys like me who were, who were big and tall stand in the back, you know, and, and make room for women to come up front. And uh, I mean, I, I kind of needed to be told, but I was told. And I, I saw that as just a better way of going to shows. It's very thoughtful of you. <laughs> well, thoughtful of Alison Wolf to tell me, <laughs> you know, I mean, re really. So you're an English prof professor now at mm -hmm. CSUCI. Mm -hmm. Some people may see this as like an unexpected change mm -hmm. in career paths. So what do you have to say about that? <laughs> um, it is it is a bit unexpected. There are not a lot of punks in, in higher ed that I encounter. Well, I shouldn't say that. There aren't a lot of punks in, at CI. Um, so I'm not, though, um, when I did my first interview at CI, one of the women interviewing me knew Razor Cake and knew who I was through Razor Cake. Um, so there are punks. Um, and she used to hang out with the Swingin' Utters in, in Santa Cruz. Um, I don't know if that band name means anything to you, but, uh, but they were kind of big in the 90s. Um, but there are a lot of punk professors around the country and a, a lot of a lot of the punks I kind of came up with are in academia now I mean part of it is just it's hard when you get get into middle age and the things that you were rebelling against are still a problem you know like there's still a lot of there's still a lot of misogyny out there you know there's still a lot of destructive capitalism there's still a lot of jobs that you get into that destroy the environment or continue to create inequity um and uh i just didn't want to do that i you know i didn't want i didn't want to trade my values for a living um and getting into higher education seemed like a way where i could create like collaborative and democratic spaces you know it felt like a way where um i could be more inclusive you know it felt like a way where i wasn't making my money on the backs of you know l laborers who were underpaid so so that that's why I got into higher ed. It, it seemed like it was one of the ways that I could I could do good um, Like every day, you know um, And uh, I don't know kind of is you know tuitions too high. That's a ripoff <laughs> But uh, Outside of that higher ed is 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 a good thing. I agree. Did you the have tuitions a, a ripoff? Yeah. Yeah, good <laughs> good protest against it when you get to college. Yeah, no, I'm not paying my tuition oh, I'm good. just playing. I'm just playing Anyways, um, did you have any doubts or hesitations when going into the educational field or ad academic field? I did because good jobs in higher ed are hard to get. I, I have a good job in higher ed. I, I have tenure. I'm a full professor. Um, but uh, jobs like mine are like 10% of the jobs in higher ed, and a lot of them are... are are poorly paid and, and temporary jobs. And, um, and so I, I was worried about having one. And I did have one of those jobs at CI for, for a while prior to getting hired on the tenure track. And, I, and like 200 people applied for my job and I got it. Um, so I, I knew it was going to be ridiculously competitive. And I knew that if I didn't succeed, that the, that the next step down was a big step down. Um, but I, you know, I guess you, you go for what you want, right? How would you say that punk history affects the way you teach today? Um, like there was always a sense, um, in, in punk rock of, a of do it yourself, like DIY, which then got co-opted by, uh, home improvement. But really it, it was never DIY. It was always, it was always do it together. You know, Todd and Danny and Katie and, uh, our 30 contributors in that first issue were the ones who made Razor Cake, not not me and not me and Todd. Um, and uh, and so 
these are the kinds of this is this is what I want. I want collaborations. I want everyone kind of coming together and um, being part of, of what we're doing. So really when I teach classes, I want them to be as democratic as possible. I want students to be able to speak. I want students speaking more in class than I'm speaking. Um, uh, if you disagree with me, I want I want to hear that. Um, I want you to make your case. I want to listen to that case and see if I'm wrong. Um, and all of that comes from punk rock, you know. Like, uh, and there's also <laughs> there's this funny thing when I was coming up in punk rock. There was a, a band called Youth Brigade, and they were all about like let's do it for the kids. <laughs> because they were the kids, you know, and now the guys in Youth Brigade are probably 60. Um, but still, there's always this sense of, well, let's, let's, do it, let's do it for the kids, and the kids meaning the people who showed up and want to be a part of this, you know, and, and so I don't know, I still kind of feel that way about, the, about teaching. For the kids. Do it for the kids, man. Yeah, sorry about calling it. you man. How, so how was your experience in the working class movement as someone who's part of the punk scene. Okay. So this is this is this is the the weird thing about me like in every space I occupy which is that I come from the swamps of Florida and I started working construction very young uh at age 13 and um when I say that I mean I, I like I didn't go to work with my dad. I I had jobs, you know, and I would work piecemeal under the table just doing um kind of the most brutal forms of manual labor. Uh, and um I I did that and then then I actually I I mean I gained a skill. I was a skilled carpenter, framing carpenter for a while. Um and I continued to work construction on and off until I was 30. Um and so there's not a lot of carpenters in punk rock. <laughs> There's not a lot of people from the swamps of Florida in punk rock. Though there are, I mean, there's a whole big uh, Florida record label, No Idea, where, with bands like Hot Water Music that actually come from backgrounds like I come from. Um, so on the one hand, I'm, I was kind of an anomaly, but on the other hand, punk rock's always been a working class thing. It's always been about the people who, who don't have access to a voice forcing their way to have a voice, you know? And, um, and so recognizing growing up as someone who's kind of dismissed as white trash that you know I don't want to be trash man I want I want to have a voice I want I don't want to be called I mean I never thought I was trash but I don't want to be called that you know I want I want I want to kind of carve my way into into the world where I belong I mean it's fair to want respect <laughs> yes thank you thank you <laughs> let's, let's all let's all go with that point so how do you identify with the working class movement well so like Right now, uh, I mean, it's hard to say that you're, you know, a PhD and a tenured full professor and you're working class because I'm not. But I, I mean, it's still inside me is still the carpenter, you know, and um, and I still I still emotionally align with with workers over bosses. And um, I mean, like I'm, I, I st I'm, I'm, I'm a union, you know, like I, we voted that <laughs> we voted to OK a strike last week. Um, so I mean I'm, and and I'm I'm very much in favor of unions. I mean, I hope you join a union. I hope you I, <laughs> I hope you work a union job. And if your job's not union, I hope you unionize. Yeah. Um, and so like I, I mean I just I that's what I identify with. I think I I, I want to live in a world where we where, where we support the the people who are at the lowest socioeconomic levels rather than uh, you know I'd rather have workers than billionaires. Um. That makes sense. <laughs> That's good. Do you wish that punk music went in a different direction than the way it is now? Uh, sometimes yes, sometimes no. I mean, there's so many directions of punk right now. You Can know? you elaborate on that? Yeah, like there's the mainstream punk that um, that has Green Day selling out you know, huge Death venues. Tones. Yeah, yeah. So all, all that stuff, and and that's fine. Um, I still have my, I, I still have Kerplunk. Um, you know, like I still have the old album by Green Day that I got uh, from Lookout Records in 1990 or whenever the hell I got it. Um, but uh, but what I really like is there is a direction of punk that I can be into. You know, there's um, a really inclusive. Uh, 
brand of punk that has a lot of voices in it and um you know and and, and it, it's open to me and i'm aware of it you know there's like bands like there's a band out of the north of england called martha and uh they're just kind of these poor queer kids who grew up in an old mining town in england the town is actually called pity me it's right outside of durham and uh like i i I get to hear their music, you know, and, and on the latest issue of Razor Cake is Mick Collins, who is a punk rock lifer, and he's been in a band called The Gories forever, and he's still putting out cool stuff, you know, and I just like, I like that there's room for the old bands to keep putting out new stuff that's, that goes in new directions. I like that there's a lot of room for um, all the bands that, all the types of bands that we were trying to include in the first issues of Razor Cake. Yeah, that's sick. I think that especially like new bands i think it's really important to like support that yeah so my last question for you is how is punk rock relevant to you how is it relevant to me um i mean f for me what i if what i want people to get out of punk rock first is let's, let's listen to some good music <laughs> you know i mean like real that, music that, yeah that's the first thing i mean i I, I hate to be this way, but I just, I love guitars and bass and, and loud drums. And um, I like melodies, but I also, I like, I like impassioned vocalists, you know, <laughs> like, um, so that's the first thing. But I also, I want that kind of do it together to community um, to thrive. I want us to, I want us to carve out democratic and collaborative spaces, you know, I want us to think about how we can make a living where we do more good than harm, you know, um, you know, that I, I think those are the parts of punk rock that I want everyone to take something from. Well, it was really nice talking to you today. Likewise. Yeah, it was fun. Thank you. <laughs> I'm Juliana Gutierrez with ECTV. Thank you for watching. Thank you for watching. I'm Lily with ECTV and I hope you enjoyed the show.